simply come to the cross today. Um, next Sunday the choir will be singing for us uh, a cantata and I hope that you can invite your friends and family to be here next Sunday morning. Uh, I, I always enjoy Easter Sunday morning and I hope that you will too as you prepare your hearts to uh, this week to follow Christ uh, as he goes to the cross, his passion, his glory. Uh, today we want to look at Palm Sunday and I've chosen as my text this morning Luke chapter 9 verses 51 through 56. Luke 9, 51 through 56. Uh, if you would follow along with me in your copy of God's Word. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his faith to go, faith to, go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him, because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And his disciples, James and John, saw it. They said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went on their way to another village. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, forgive us our sins this morning. Only because of what we celebrate this time of year. The cross and the resurrection. The death and the giving of life. Father, we know that you say in your word that you were raised for our justification. You also died as a substitute for sinners. And Father, as we approach you this morning, as we continue to approach you in your word, help us. Help us to grasp the enormity of this day. The day when palms were stretched across and waved because the Messiah was here. Father, I ask that you would help us change. Help us change. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Of course, Palm Sunday is the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry, or at least before the cross. And we read about that in another place in Luke's Gospel as well, in chapter 19, Verses 37 and 38, we read these words. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now our text this morning, about ten verses earlier, comes at a point in time where Jesus sets his face, his ministry, his passion to the city of Jerusalem. That was what he came to do. It was right after the feeding of the 5,000 it was right after Peter's confession, Lord, you are the Christ. It was right after Jesus foretells of the first time of his death. Do you realize that Jesus, when he called the disciples to himself, didn't immediately tell the disciples that he was going to die? I thought that always interesting. That he waited and eventually told the disciples that his ministry involved death. And of course his disciples would say, No way! Far be it from you! Because their understanding of the gospel and the kingdom at that time was misguided. It was eight days 
Our text is about eight days later after that. Um, we find the transfiguration. And Jesus rebuking unclean spirits. And then all of a sudden, you know, they, they're asking, well, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Because in their minds, the kingdom is going to be an earthly kingdom. And there's no doubt that Palm Sunday is the prophecy fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10 read thus. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. I mean, this announcement that Jesus is coming to Jerusalem, that previously had set his faith, faith towards Jerusalem, and that he's coming on the foal of a donkey, is the fulfillment of a prophecy that was prophesied many years before about the coming Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. And he's coming in Jerusalem. And he's coming in to Jerusalem in a way that is, that is with much fanfare. People are excited. His disciples are amazed and disciples. And they're excited. He's not going to just rule from Jerusalem. He's going to rule the entire world. Think about that. There is going to be one ruler in the world. And it's eventually, people are going to know his name, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. And they're excited. Wouldn't you be? If everything that you had wished and dreamed for was finally coming to pass, all that God had promised, you could see before your eyes, it would almost be like if we were witnessing today the, the second coming of our Lord, which I believe could happen at any moment. That I would see Jesus coming on the clouds. And the end of the world would be at hand. And we would be standing before the judgment seat of God. And that would be exciting to me. It would be, it'd be, it'd be thrilling my heart. My, my heart would be pounding. It's the same with you. It's like when you see uh, your child graduate. You know, you, you may not notice any other name, but you do notice the name of your child when it's called, don't you? You're just saying, hallelujah, it's over. No. <laughs> I remember... You know, my dad, during my life, never told me that he was proud of me except one time. That's when I graduated from Baylor. He never told me any time, but he said he was finally proud of me. That meant a lot. But we're proud. And when you see all that you have worked for finally achieved, it's a wonderful thing. Or maybe you haven't worked for it. Maybe it's something you've hoped would happen. I'm sure people who play the lottery and win the these big jackpots I hear about are probably thrilled. Uh, they, they, they probably haven't hoped for that long. They're not as excited as the people in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. I want you to know that this is excitement because their whole lives have been about a Messiah that was going to come on the foal of a donkey into Jerusalem and they're waving these palms and praising God. And they're going, well, how is he going to do it? How, how is he going to take the throne? Is he going to have a revolution? And, and, and is, that, is that the way he's going to do it? Or, or is he going to bring fire down from heaven and poof! Everybody that doesn't agree with him is gone. You know, that's a very efficient management technique. I, I've, I've never been able to do that, though. But that's what they're thinking. How is he going to do it? And how many of us may get killed? It's a tremendous time. And the Pharisees had a reason, though, for being scared. 
Because they wanted Jesus silenced. They didn't want to hear him anymore. You see, he was a threat to their authority. You know, and a threat to all that they stood for. Jesus had an authority that they did not have. He spoke with authority. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees only would, would quote others, who would quote others, who would quote others, who would quote others. Jesus just said, as we read earlier, he said, I am he. He didn't quote anybody else. He quoted his own self. Now, you have authority when you say, I say that I am. I say that I'm the father of Abraham. I say this. You're claiming authority. And they hated him for it. They really did. On the other hand, they were scared also of the Roman rule. They were scared what would happen. What would, what would the Romans do if this guy is coming in and he's claiming to be the Messiah, a king? Would they get persecuted? And so they said in Luke 19, verse 39 and 40, they say to Jesus, these Pharisees, Teacher, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The fact that Jesus is Messiah is undisputed. The fact will be undisputed because even if in missions people give their lives for the cause of Christ, the very stones, the very, very aspects of creation will cry out that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. There is no doubt about that. But he's not going to be silent any longer. One of the things that the disciples didn't understand, the Pharisees didn't understand, is that the concept of the kingdom. They, they, they weren't sure how he was going to be king. In one instance, they were correct that Jesus is the king of Israel. And his kingdom he's inaugurating will bring pre peace to the nations. And it will spread from sea to sea. See, the hope of the world... And I want to say this, the hope of the United States and the hope of every country in the world ultimately, well, let me, let me say it, is not a, it is, it is, it is a better government. And that better government is ruled by one person, namely Jesus Christ. It is through the gospel that we have hope in this world. We can be as politically involved, and I am as politically want to be involved as I can be in defending what we believe is right and good. Okay? But ultimately, guess how you change society? You do that, you do that, did I say you do that? You do that because the gospel is powerful in and of itself to change the hearts of people. You can legislate a lot of things, but the people's hearts are still going to be the same. I look forward to see a day where there's a revival truly taking place, not only in this church, in this city, in this state, but also in the United States of America and around this world. Amen. And on this Palm Sunday, there will be a final fulfillment of Palm Sunday in the future. Revelation chapter 9, chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, says this. And this is around the throne room of God. Picture this, around the throne room of God. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from every tribe, from peoples of, and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Palm Sunday doesn't end when we die. It, it goes on forever and ever, and ever, and ever. We will be sitting around, and we're not going to be playing harps on a cloud. No, that's not what it is. It, 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 it is we will be worshiping him in a way where we are ascribing to him. And it may not be just we're sitting there standing just singing a song. It may be our obedience to God in heaven and the learning of truth in heaven are going to cause us to stand up and wave branches of praise with our hands. I mean, I mean, this is an amazing picture. Amazing picture. And it's kind of like, as 
Someone has said a, a dress rehearsal. What we're doing right now is a dress rehearsal for heaven. Um, I find it amazing today when you read the papers, and especially in Hollywood, people say, I, I got spirituality, but I don't like the church. I'm saying, brother, if you are my brother, let me just say this. If you don't like gathering together with the church and singing and, and extolling God and waving your hands to God, then you might not even be part of God's people. Remember the Pharisees? I mean, what did Jesus call them? I just read a passage of Scripture today that says these were the people who believed in Jesus, who, who claimed to be the father, their father was Abraham, and what did Jesus call them? Devils, didn't he? Little devils. Your, your father is the devil, and the truth is not in him. I want you to think about Palm Sunday in heaven, where we will be with people too, in, too many, too great to even count, whether they're billions or trillions or wh whatever number it is that is after that. Um, a thousand, thousand, thousand millions. From people from Bangladesh and Poland and the United States and Hungary and Czechoslovakia and all the peoples of the world. And if Jesus had taken what the disciples thought he would do the first day, or the first Palm Sunday, and said, okay, I'm going to make an earthly reign, guess what? We would not be talking today about Jesus Christ at all, or we would not be talking about heaven at all. Because what Jesus did in coming, he had to go to the cross and die. And the disciples did not understand that. They were like, do y'all do watch the NCAA tournament? I'm sure you do, right? No. No, okay, no. Well, yesterday there was a civil war between Kentucky and Kentucky, or between Kentucky and Louisville, and Kentucky won. And Rick Pitino, coach of Louisville uh, Cardinals, said afterwards, yeah, so was the Caesar a failure? He says, no, it wasn't a failure. I'm going to go to Miami tomorrow and celebrate. Of course, he can go to Miami just any time he wants to because he makes that. But he says, I'm going to celebrate because of the relationships I have with the players. And, and, and what, what, what he was saying is that there's, there's something more, I believe, than just winning a game or winning a battle. But back in Luke 9, Jesus set, sets it out. He says, listen, I, when the drays, they draw near, I'm going to be taken up. And he set his face towards Jerusalem. It says in verse 22 of chapter 9, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by his elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed on the third day. Jesus now tells his disciples, listen, my kingdom is a kingdom right now of death. It's a kingdom of where I die. In verse 44 of chapter 9, he says these words. Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men. And in verse 45, he says, They did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them that they should not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Therefore, the disciples' understanding of what Jesus was doing was flawed. And on this Palm Sunday, I want you to understand this truth. Here is the truth. That when we misunderstand Palm Sunday, the kingdom of God, the way it's structured, we will misunderstand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. See, a lot of people will think a disciple is someone who is special, who is above an ordinary Christian. But that is so far from the truth that it, it, is, it is blasphemy almost to utter it. Because what Jesus says about the coming into the kingdom and how his kingdom is going to be formed calls us to be disciples or followers of Christ in the same way Jesus is the follower of God's plan. So the question I'm going to ask today is this. How is God's, what was God's will for Jesus as the Messiah, and what is God's will for us as disciples of Christ? Let me answer the first question. And I'm going to do this quickly. 
First of all, God's will and plan was for Jesus to die. Period. It was to die. He set his face to Jerusalem because he knew the Father's plan from the beginning of time and before again was to die. Look at it together. It says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, it says in verse 51, chapter 9, he set his face to Jerusalem. Okay, that meant something a lot different than the disciples thought. You see, in verse 46, it says, and an argument arose among them to, uh, as to which of them was the greatest. In other words, they were thinking, okay, Jesus is going to set up his kingdom, and now I want to say, am I going to be greater than someone else? They're thinking purely earthly, conquering victory is all that matters. Winning was all that mattered to them. How was the kingdom going to look once we beat up on those Romans? Once we beat up on those, those Pharisees? Once we beat up and win? But that's not what Jesus had in mind. Jesus meant that he was going to die. Look at verse Luke chapter 18. Luke 18, verses 31 through 33. And we see this meant one thing. Jerusalem meant one thing. Death. In, verses, in Luke 18, verse 31, it says, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written of the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and shamefully treated, and will spit, be spit upon, and after flogging they will kill him. Jesus set his face to die. And when he set his face to die, he had in mind the redemption of sinners like you and me. And you ask, why did he have to die? Why did Jesus have to die? Isn't there plan B? Wasn't there a plan B? I have one answer for that. No. It's the first word children learn normally. Right? They learn no. They don't learn yes, mommy, or yes, daddy, I'll do that. They learn no. But I want to use that word in saying that Jesus had to die. And there wasn't a plan B, there wasn't a plan C, that God from the beginning of time had chosen to redeem a people for himself through the death of Christ as a substitute for sinners. Now think about it. Jesus was what? Was he human? Yes, he was. Was he divine? Yes, he was. He was fully God and fully man. He was 100% man and 100% God. Now, I'm of the particular belief that Jesus could not have sinned, ever. But he did have a human side. Because I don't like to separate the natures. But if you think about his humanity, did Jesus cry, ever? Yeah, we, we know the famous verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. And you all have that memorized, right? Good. We, 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 we know that Jesus got hungry. We know that Jesus probably heart loved his mother. We know that Jesus had a love for probably his half-brothers. We probably, probably he thought about, you know, there, there, there would have been a lot of luxuries that he could have stayed around and enjoyed. But the Bible says that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So all the things that we have done, all the things that he could have done in this world, there was a joy that was set before him and that was redeeming an innumerable people that are going to be in heaven because their sins are forgiven. Their guilt is expunged. Now how does that relate to us? Well, God's will for us, just like Jesus, is to die. Just like Jesus, it's to die die to ourselves 
and this earthly idea of winning in this world. Because if we are serious as a body and as a church about whether it's the Great Commission, whether it's missions, it is going to cost us things in this world. You've had pastors and members of this church who have given their lives, their finances, in a sacrificial way for the spread of the gospel. But look what Jesus says in verses 52 and 53 of our text. See, Jesus' plan for, uh, for, for God's plan for Jesus was to die, and God's plans for us is to die. And it says in verse 52, and he sent messengers ahead of him, who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. Now it doesn't matter whether the rejection of Jesus was any other reason. But I believe the rejection of Jesus because he was the Messiah. He, he could have been, they, they just didn't like Jews. The Samaritans and Jews didn't have much to do with each other. But what matters is Jesus is being rejected. James and John asked, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? They were saying, okay, the time is now to win this thing. Let's, let's, let's put it in the books. The score is settled. It's over with. And Jesus surprised them because he rebuked them. It says in what? Verse 55, he turned and rebuked them. And what did they do? They went on to another village. They went on somewhere else. Um, you know, they, they'd probably said, let, 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 let it happen. Now what does this mean to us? It means that if we believe that the gospel was given for our comfort rather than for our service and death, we have a misunderstanding of the gospel. The gospel does say, count the cost. You know, people will count the cost when they build a tower, doesn't it say? So if you count the cost of following Christ about having sins forgiven, doesn't mean that you can just join the country club and live like you want to. Jesus is not only our Savior, He's our Lord. And if we separate those two aspects of His character, we don't have the gospel anymore. It is so important to understand that the call to the forgiveness of sins is also a call to follow a Savior that you love. Amen. Right? Amen. So the call that Jesus had the will of God was not on our lives to maybe die like he did in ransom for many, but ours is to die in service to others. We're called to serve others. We're called to minister to others. In fact, everyone who names the name of Christ is a minister, aren't they? They're a minister because they minister. They serve each other. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23 and 24, If anyone who come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake will save it. The message of Palm Sunday. Jesus knew God's will. And now we know God's will. Jesus didn't die on the cross for our lives to become easier. He didn't die. He did die on the cross that our guilt would be espunged, our debt to God would be forgiven. But that debt enables us, now that we're forgiven, we have the ability to serve the living God. We have the ability to serve others in a sacrificial way. Because guess what, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, this is not my home. This world is going to be destroyed. It is polluted. I hate sin in my own life. I hate sin in my own body. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. And the only reason I say that is because what God is doing and has done in my heart. See, the reason why Jesus died and the reason why we die is because God has given us the privilege of a of the process with him. He has called us as disciples to take 
this gospel, the unreached peoples, peoples who have never heard of the gospel before, which, which amounts to about what? Two point, I was reading this today, this morning, 2.83 billion people in the world have never heard, heard the name of Jesus Christ. And they're going to die in their sins and go to hell for all eternity because they haven't heard, because they have rejected the God that has been revealed to them in their heart and in nature. Their rebellion is what they'll pay for. And so as we look at that on Palm Sunday, Jesus died. It was God's will that Jesus die. And it is God's will that we die to the things of this world, to the things that would, we think will make us happy. But only the, the things in this world you think are going to make you happy have only temporary value. They're not going to last forever. That, that, that next cup of Coke or coffee doesn't taste as good as the previous one. But that is not so with Christ. The more you drink and thirst for Christ, the sweeter it gets. Amen. And so today, I want you to commit your life to God, to Christ. And if you're here and you, you don't know Christ, Christ is calling you. He's saying for you to repent and turn because Jesus is the Messiah and Lord, not only of Jerusalem, but all the world. And so as we sing, lift your hearts. Come. Step out if God is calling you to make a confession public this morning. What you already have done in your heart, namely have enthroned Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do bow. We do ask you to forgive our sins, to cleanse us.